Welcome to the Gazelle School of Business webinar on finding and retaining new customers. This is one of many free webinars we're offering to the piano service industry that will cover every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. Our team will be monitoring the chat and Q&A, so ask your questions there, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. All right, let's dive right in. You work too hard to be uncertain whether the holes in your calendar will fill with new or returning customers. So over the course of your career, you're going to spend a lot of time and money trying to get new customers. So the last thing you want to see happen is to have them disappear into the ethos. You shouldn't have to ask, did I make the right career choice or am I going to go hungry? Every time you see an empty slot in your calendar. And these kinds of struggles all come out of not having enough customers. Now, this is your first time joining us on one of our webinars. I'm George, and I'm here tonight with Timothy Barnes and the team of Gazelle, where we help you save your time, wow your customers, and grow your piano service business. Hey, Tim, I think you're muted. I am <laughs> muted. How are you guys tonight? George, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad to have my mic on. Uh, you know, especially because over the last 17 years, I spent running a piano service business I had to wrestle with this topic at multiple stages. First, I was building my client base from nothing. And then midway through, I raised my rates and realized the people I had attracted so far were not my ideal customer anymore. So I had to rethink my advertising to make sure I attracted better customers who were willing to pay the higher rates while at the same time managing the expectations of my existing customers so they didn't all walk out the back door. Then I started training and adding technicians to our team, expanding to other cities in the region and realizing that every time I opened a new city, I had to become a new business all over again. Yeah, Tim, that's a really good point. This isn't just a topic for new technicians who are just getting started. This is a topic every business is going to face every year they're in business. All right, let's dive right in. Finding and retaining customers is easy. If you... Step one, focus your efforts. Step two, build your tribe. And step three, set new goals that are focused on helping you grow with the right customers instead of jumping at every customer that comes your way. So let's start with step one, focusing your efforts on the right things. The best way to tell the difference between a good customer and a bad one is by the smile on your face as you leave the appointment. Now, finding these kinds of customers isn't hard if you do the right things. Now, this can be done with blunt force, which looks a lot like accepting every customer that comes your way. You hope they're good, and you tell yourself, I have to take on these bad customers who don't pay well or aren't my ideal client type, so I can find and keep the good customers who do value my work. But it doesn't work that way. And this can be even more frustrating when you get poor advice from piano technicians with established businesses. That sounds a lot like, just do what I did 30 years ago. It worked for me, or 20 years ago, or 10 years ago. But the reality is, advertising platform, platforms are changing at a dizzying pace. Now, there are some things about doing client acquisition that will always work regardless of what platform is being used. But there are other things that only work for a period of time, or they are strategies that only work on a specific advertising platform. What a great point, Tim. If you look at the last two webinars we did on selling your story and building a powerful and simple website, we covered these two topics first because they're the foundation. All of this is really about one thing, client acquisition. And it's really important to understand how all of this works together. The things that are changing at a dizzying pace are the platforms, technology, marketing strategies needed to succeed on each platform. But the things that haven't changed in thousands of years are the ways you engage with humans, humans with stories, stories that you tell so potential customers can see themselves as your customer, understand the value that you provide and how you're different from everyone else. The way you tell your story is going to be universal across all the platforms. The strategies that succeed or will constantly change, which is why getting advice from established technicians isn't always helpful if they're not up to date with the current platforms. Especially if all they do is give you generic and typical advice. 
So for example, I'm sure you have heard somebody say, do good work and your name will spread like wildfire because word of mouth advertising is the be all end all. And if you just do this one thing, it will be all you ever need. Well, good work is required to have your name spread. And of course, word of mouth is a great form of advertising, but there's a lot more to it than that which is why we did an entire webinar on getting online reviews and leveraging your word of mouth. So check that out if you want more on this topic. Or how about this? Uh, if you give a piano teacher a discount, I think they wrote a kid's book about that called If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And spoiler alert, if you give a piano teacher a discount who's already happy with their technician, they're going to tell you to please go away. Nothing's going to happen unless they're deeply unhappy with their current technician, in which case they would have hired you just because you called. And if they take the discount because of the discount, then they're gonna be spending, uh, sending a lot of people your way who are long on expectations and short on willingness to pay a fair price. And because three out of three of these outcomes are not a great situation, you've probably met someone who insists, well, you should never discount your work. And then they'll say things like, I did that once and I'll never do it again. Well, the reality is both of these responses are wrong for different reasons. Always giving a discount and never giving a discount are both bad ideas. We'll talk about why a little later. Or perhaps you have heard somebody say, do discount work at a dealership. Kiss the ring and the salesman who is there to sell pianos, not service them, will make you wealthy. Yeah, that's gonna work about as well as you would expect. And we're gonna unpack what a good strategy for working with a dealership looks like. And if we're going to get a little more sophisticated and relevant to our present day, and then you'll find some people saying, well, just run Google ads. This is the be all and end all. And the sun will be shining. The birds will sing. Stravinsky's right of spring will play from the heavens as you waltz into hundreds of new customers who will always service their piano on time. And you will almost always have multiple people say, and by all means, don't do the yellow pages except as hard as it might be to imagine, the yellow pages and print ads in some publications are still a source of new customers in rural tight-knit communities that don't need Google and don't have reliable internet connections. And you've probably also heard someone say, well, you have to spend money to make money. And this is a generic piece of advice that'll probably result in flushing good money down a bad hole. Again, yes, this is technically true, but it's also true that if you spend money on bad advertising or bad platforms, you'll never see the light of day. And to cap all this off, none of this is exclusively true. So as soon as you hear somebody exclusively say, do this or only do that, what you need to hear in your head is, this worked for me, it might work for you. The platforms are constantly changing, and if the data they are giving you is more than five years old, it's probably out of date. So we're going to start <clears throat> by talking about things like, why do you need new customers? This seems like a really simple question, but you need to think through why specifically you need new customers. Because building an initial tribe of customers is different than replacing your customers who churn which is different than replacing lower revenue customers with higher paying customers, which is different than rebranding your company and replacing all your customers over time. And all of this has an added layer of complexity if you've recently relocated to a new area or you're planning to build or expand your business to a new city. Another term that you need to be familiar with is the idea of churn. This is your company's organic customer attrition rate. This is the rate at which you lose customers every year due to things that are outside your control. A customer moves out of the area, sells their piano, or stops servicing it because, quite frankly, they're not playing it anymore. They're, these are all outside of your control. There's nothing you can do about it. And you have to think about offsetting the number of customers who churn every year with new customers. If you lose a customer to churn every time you gain a new customer, your business will never grow. And on the other side of this discussion are questions like how I expand my tribe and grow faster than my rate of churn. This is where it's really helpful to understand where all new customers come from. 
there are people in your inner circle who personally know you outside of your work as a piano technician, uh, people who don't know you, but do know someone who knows you, and people who don't know you and don't know anybody who does. See, most people start their business in that inner circle because it's really easy and it's cheap to find customers in this group. And as you move into the next group, it's still relatively easy and cheap because these customers tend to find you through their friends. But once you exhaust everyone who owns a piano in your inner circles, in the blink of an eye, it goes from being very easy and cheap to find new customers to super expensive and difficult. To reach a customer in the outer circle, you have to diversify your approach and have a balanced game plan for customer acquisition. Having a balanced approach means you always do these four things. First, networking and building local relationships. This is essentially working your inner circle for new customers. So maybe one of your customers met a new friend, right? You're constant, those opportunities are just constantly coming and you need to continually network those inner circles. Second, you need to run paid ads online and elsewhere, which is mining your outer circle for new customers. And then regularly remind existing customers who are currently due for service. This is retaining your current customers because every customer you don't have to replace is a customer you don't have to pay to replace. And calling people on the phone and calling existing customers who don't respond to emails and text. And Tim, it's important to note here that we're not talking about cold calling strangers through the white pages. This is calling on people who you want to network with or do business with. But it isn't saying, hi, I tune pianos. Do you like me? Hoping that they'll say yes. I was hoping a piano tuner would call me today. Let me drop everything to talk to you. We all know this, but it requires more tact than that. And we'll be covering these strategies in more detail in just a few minutes. All of this should lead you to ask the question and consider, how much should I be spending on customer acquisition? And there's a really easy answer to this question called the CACTIV ratio. This is your total customer acquisition cost to attract one paid customer. So just average all your marketing, website costs, printing of business cards, referral discounts, new customer discounts, any money you spend trying to attract new customers divided by the total number of new paid customers you got this year. So don't count prospects. Only count the actual number of new customers who paid you money. And that gives you the numerator, which is your average annual customer acquisition cost. Now divide this by the average lifetime value of your customers. Gazelle gives you this number in your annual report each year when we email you your end of year report. So just use the number in your 2020 report that was emailed to you on January 2nd of this year. Now, the only thing to note is that if you're new to Gazelle or you don't process all your revenue through our invoices, then you'll need to calculate this number manually. But essentially, you want to know, on average, how much money do my active customers give me each year? And how many years do they remain active? And this will give you your average lifetime value of one customer. And George, this number is really fun. But if you want a shortcut, just use 5% of total annual revenue until you pull together all the data for your actual capital ratio. Let's pretend like it comes back at something equal to 5% of annual revenue because for a piano service business, it's probably gonna be really close to this number unless you are charging a bazillion dollars for every customer every year, right? So what this means is you can spend up to 5% of annual revenue on all marketing expenses. And if you go over this number, it does not matter how good your advertising is or how wonderfully you design an ad, you are paying people more than they are paying you to come into your business. But the opposite is true as well. If you are spending less than this number uh, and on all marketing, then it means you are underutilizing the potential of your business and you have some room to make money by spending on paid ads. It's a really sweet thing to know because this number clearly tells you when to turn paid ads on or off. Lastly, now that you know how much you can spend, you need to ask, what should I outsource? You see, you're a great piano technician. And that doesn't mean you can also be a great digital marketing director, a good graphic designer, or an outside salesperson. 
If these rules are not your passion, then becoming good at them is going to cost you time, money, and a lot of emotional energy, and that isn't always a good thing. So you can consider surrounding yourself with experts who are going to help you succeed in client acquisition and find ways to hire these things out, like graphic design, social media posts, or potential customer calls, et cetera, which will give you more time to really focus your steps, your efforts on step two, building your tribe. Seth Godin says, you can build any company on a thousand raving customers, where a raving customer is defined as someone who isn't just a casual client who hires you once every five years. A raving customer is the type of person who calls you out for a basic tuning, then listens to you as their guide, and loves doing what you recommend. So you might be asking, how do I find these customers? Well, the first step is to define your tribe. And if you want a great book to read on this topic, pick up Tribes by Seth Godin. It's an easy read and will be well worth your time. Tribes by definition are small. So you might build a large business around a few different types of tribes, but you have to define the tribes you serve because you will need to market to each one differently. The idea that you can service all piano owners in your city and treat them all the same is a strategic miscalculation. This is all about defining for your business who the character is at the center of your story, what type of person you are looking to serve, and what are their motivations for wanting to do business with you. So this could be as simple as I service people who use their piano every week. Uh, this is my ideal customer. This is my tribe or my tribe is people who care for their piano because it's one of the most important things in their home. Another way to state this would be to look for their motivation and identity as connected to their piano. Why do they own a piano? What does it add to their life? So it sounds something like, I want to service pianos for active musicians, or I want to service pianos for people who value music as an educational tool. You might need to stitch a few tribes together to create a large enough clientele to support your business. But here's how this works in the real world. Sometimes people who are not in one of your tribes accidentally book an appointment. And you know what happens when they do this? They don't stick around, nor should they, because they don't fit in. It's a success for your business if a customer who is outside of your tribe accidentally comes around for a little while and then never comes back. It's also a success if this person never clicks on your paid ads in the first place or never calls because they self-selected out on your website because they don't resonate with the story of your business. See, good business owners don't get caught up chasing every customer under the sun. They focus on their tribe. And they focus on growing it with more like-minded people. But they also often encounter a problem. As their business grows, it becomes harder to manage these relationships, which means you do all this work to find a bunch of people to serve. You spend all this time nurturing these relationships and identifying and building your tribe. And then you accidentally let people fall through the cracks. While it is a success if someone outside your tribe never books an appointment, it is a tragedy and a sign of a struggling business if a customer inside your tribe never books another appointment. Now, Gazelle's automated reminders help you plug a lot of these holes and keep good customers coming back. But more importantly, Gazelle reminders help you focus on finding new people to add to your tribe because good customers are not falling through the cracks or slipping out the back door. Because this is true, you get to focus your energy elsewhere. This means your limited marketing dollars will go further and you will have better success because you are not wasting a bunch of money splashing ads all over the internet just to replace all the good customers who are slipping through the cracks. And when you keep good customers and focus your marketing on finding more good customers, it makes it really easy to grow your business with the right people. When you know who your people are, your marketing will attract great customers. Your reminders will keep your best customers wowed and happy as they easily book appointments through Gazelle. And the clarity of your website will make it really easy for the wrong people to self-select out before they ever call you. Which means you have to be really comfortable saying goodbye to the wrong customers. 
because they're not your people to begin with. And allowing them to leave is going to make more room for you to better serve more of your best customers. If you're not okay with this, you'll never be happy with your marketing because you'll constantly fall into the trap of trying to create an ad that speaks to everybody, which is a misnomer because ads that speak to everybody actually speak to nobody. They simply don't work. They're a waste of money. Having a higher density of the right customers in your book of business also raises your customer retention rate and the total lifetime value of each customer to your business, which in turn positively affects your capital ratio, which means you have more and more money to spend on advertising. And if someone ever tells you that you have to do a bunch of work for a lot of the wrong customers, because that's the only way to find the good ones, well, they're mistaken. Finding customers shouldn't have to feel like panning for gold. So bad advertising attracts the wrong kind of customer, and it wastes your time. It's as simple as that. It's a strategic miscalculation to think that haphazardly throwing some words on a website, running some paid ads will attract good customers. Instead, the opposite is true. You'll spend more time managing bad customers who drive you crazy and don't want to pay what you're worth. And because you spend so much time managing them, you end up struggling to attract a bunch of good customers. And as a general rule, Bad customers don't magically turn into good customers. There's a better way to grow your business. So let's talk about some marketing strategies that will attract the kind of people you're looking for. Treat piano teachers like they are their own tribe. Not everybody in this tribe is going to be in your tribe, but they all have similar needs and tend to be a tightly knit group of individuals. And think about this. Every tribe has influencers and followers, so not all members of a tribe are the same. If you win over an influencer, you will ultimately win over the entire tribe. So let's talk about practical things you can do if you want to reach the piano teachers in your service area. So first, sit down with them over coffee and tell them, I'm trying to do a better job referring my customers to piano teachers in the area. And I would love to hear more from you about what your ideal customer is, what kinds of students you serve, and how I can send the right customers your way. Then take notes and copy the piano teacher on an email every time you send a potential student their way. That's it. Second, look for ways to serve them or their students. Maybe you sponsor the food at a recital or provide the contact that they need to secure a venue or fill in the blank. The point is you identify a need and you offer to fill it. If there's a piano teacher in town who you don't know personally, know as a friend, don't call them up and, and say, hi, I'm another piano tuner in town, pick me. Instead, show general in, genuine interest in serving them by sending the right customers their way. This is all you really need to do. Even if the piano teacher has an established relationship with someone else, as soon as you start sending prospective students their way, they'll begin referring you alongside their current piano technician. And if you do the things we talked about in the Selling Your Story and Building a Simple and Powerful website, you won't even need to say much about who you are or what you do or who your ideal customers are or how your services differ from the others around you. All you'll need to do is pay for their coffee, smile, show interest in how you can serve them, spend 30 seconds telling them about the philosophical problem you solve for your customers. And when your coffee cup is empty, thank them for their time and leave them just one of your business cards, unless they ask for more. Because at this point, you can weigh confident of two things. Number one, they will go to your website. And two, they'll like what they see. And even if they're not personally ready to make a switch, they'll end up asking for more of your cards and recommending you alongside their current piano technician. Often all it takes is sending them the first one or two prospective students their way. Next, treat all of your venues like they are a separate tribe. Here is how you get venues. Run a paid ad in all their programs or at least the programs involving classical music or piano concertos if this venue is a symphony. It is helpful to go to some concerts and try to meet the stage hands before or after the event. It's not necessary. And after three or four shows, email the director, tell them that you are a patron and one of their sponsors 
and ask them to lunch. And then focus the entire conversation on the venue and its vision for its place in the community. Spend 30 seconds sharing your business one-liner and let your website tell the story for you on a page called Piano Tuning and Seasonal Service for Live Events or Concert Venues. Next, treat general musicians of all types as a separate tribe. And this includes vocalists, string and woodwind players, band conductors, chorus teachers, community orchestra leaders, people who learn to piano as an accompaniment to their primary instrument, guitarists, drummers, keyboard players, anyone and everyone who plays music and who may or may not own a piano. For these people who happen to own a piano, now here's how you get these customers. When you connect with them or your paths cross, you're going to deliver to them the one-liner you created for your business during the Selling Your Story webinar. You're going to answer any questions they have and as quickly as possible, turn the conversation back around to be all about them, their interests, their passions, and their ambitions in life. And George, for the people in this group who don't own a piano, maybe they're just a vocalist or uh, they're a trumpet player, right? Uh, just be an awesome human being who cares about people. And if you have a great one-liner that captures the problem you solve in your customers' lives, you can easily use this to turn somebody who doesn't own a piano into a raving fan who will send you customers. But don't spend any money running paid ads to these people. And don't feel the need to go out of your way to meet them. Let it happen organically and be ready with your one-liner when you find your paths crossing. And the next uh, group of pianists as a separate, uh, treat the pianists as a separate tribe. These are people who actually enjoy playing their piano or people for whom the piano is their primary or only instrument. Now, here's how you connect with these customers. First, it's important to reiterate that just because someone owns a piano does not mean you want them as a customer. But in most cases, it's well worth your effort to try. So offer a free piano owner's guide on your website. Make this exclusive to your area and focus on being a local guide to people looking to care for their piano in their community. And get lots of Google reviews or online reviews on public forums. And run Google ads or other digital ads that point to a landing page on your website. This is a great way to connect with pianists who are outside your circle of influence. This catches people who are moving to the area and people who are buying a used piano for the first time. Now, most of the time, these people are not connected to people you know. So Google, your website, and online reviews are a great way to connect with them. And consider going upstream a bit and network with piano movers who are interacting with piano owners long before they ever start searching for a local piano technician. Also, network with house cleaners who work in the nicer part of town. These people are often unskilled and unqualified to clean expensive pianos in wealthy customers' homes. So just tell the business owner, or if this is a freelance cleaner, just tell them you are happy to teach them or their staff and be available for a video call if any of their people have a question about a piano at a customer's house. And use homeowner services like Thumbtack or Angie's List, Porch, Nextdoor, other platforms to connect with local homeowners. You can also tell piano teachers that you can help prep the piano for their students' college audition videos or sponsor all the senior recitals for high schoolers in your town by giving them a $50 gift card, telling piano teachers you want to support and applaud their efforts. No strings attached, just budget $500 a year, give out 10 of these as part of your advertising. Wow the teachers in your area and flood your business with lots of goodwill from the influencers in their local tribes. Because pianists are often solo musicians you have to find creative ways to connect with these people. And most of the time, starting your conversation, iTunes pianos, pick me, isn't going to work. You have to think about it in terms of there's a tribe of people out there called I love playing the piano. How can I serve them? How can I identify a problem in their musical life and solve it? Or how can I serve the people who serve them? Next, you have a group called non-pianist piano owners. This customer might be a facilitator for somebody who is a pianist, like a parent or a grandparent with a promising student, or they could be a furniture owner with a player system installed. 
right? This might or might not be the type of customer you want to invest in. And maybe you only choose to invest in these people who are in this tribe if they are a parent of a piano student, or maybe if they're in this tribe, you only invest in them if they are somebody who is heading towards one of your other primary tribes. So maybe they've owned a piano for years and have just retired and they, you know, they have the player system on it, but now they're actually planning on learning to play. This is one of the hardest tribes of people to reach because oftentimes you get connected with them only through a piano teacher, a piano dealer, a piano mover, or through paid ads on Google. But especially for parents of piano students, you reach these people by creating a lead generator document on your website called five things to help your pianist fall in love with practicing or three tips for making your piano look like a million bucks. And then offer this resource through your website as a guide for people who know nothing about how to care for a piano. And once you have this guide, you can even target some ads for these people through a landing page so that when they Google how to get Sharpie off my piano keys or how to clean my piano, you have a resource, an ad, and a page ready and waiting for them. So next, treat churches and businesses like they're their own tribe. Now, churches are hard because the person at the front desk is never the person you want to talk to. And businesses are the same way, which is why you use the same marketing tactics. So here's how you reach them. One, go through your tribe. When you hear your customers mention that they attend church, then say, you know, most church pianists have a really hard time playing soft during a prayer or communion. I just want to let you know that I know how to fix that. It's one of my specialties. Now, the next time your customer is sitting in church and the pianist starts playing, what they're going to be thinking about is you. And they'll go up to the pianist afterwards and say, hey, is our piano really difficult to play soft during a prayer? And the pianist is going to exclaim, oh, my goodness, yes, how did you know? And your client's going to tell them, I didn't know that was a problem until recently, but I know who can fix it. Here's their number. Another thing you can do is create a lead generating guide on your website called a deacon's guide to caring for the church's piano. Again, this is a downloadable guide that you advertise on your website or in paid ads and email out to people who request it. Another way to get into churches is to create a special form on your website called send your music minister a gift where your customers can put in their music minister's details and you will email them an X dollar off coupon on behalf of their friend, your customer. And lastly, it takes some work, but you can network around to get in touch with the head of the denomination for that region. Um, and in January and August, you give them a special holiday special that is only on your website during the month of January and August. And then every year, the our holiday special is back for a limited time. Reserve your spot today email goes out. And by sending this to your contact at the denomination level, you get them to share it with all their music ministers. And the last group or tribe you will service is institutions who own lots of pianos and weeks worth of work. So here is how you get these customers. First, one approach is to simply contact the technician with the current job and contract and offer to be a pinch hitter or offer to help them clean all the pianos during his next bulk tuning. This is something he probably doesn't have time for. So if you're a young technician and you're really wanting to just like do anything and everything, um, you could even trade that in exchange for watching him prep and voice the concert instrument. And boy, I can tell you as somebody who's been in that role, I would love to have somebody running around with the vacuum who I knew wasn't gonna break anything. Um, you know, And that's a great way to get in and start building relationships there. Or you could go another route and of just trying to meet the piano professor and then offering to do a free inventory evaluation report for the university each year as an independent third party or try talking to the dealer or piano movers who supply their pianos and ask if they would support you when you bid on the contract. And to get yourself to that bidding table when that contract goes to bid, honestly, talk to all your customers who have the domain xyz.edu. Ask them to connect you with the procurement office of that institution. 
And if this is a state institution, then contact their procurement office directly and tell them you'd like information on when this contract is up for bid again. And usually you'll have to register as a vendor and go through a formal process. Then you might maybe meet the individual professors who teach music on the side and take them out to lunch. Or keep in mind, there are sometimes two different contracts that you can bid on. There's the concert, there's the, uh, concert work and professor's pianos and the practice room pianos, which are essentially the lower quality pianos. Now, in many cases, your goal is just to get on the radar and to make enough noise so you can get invited to bid on the job the next time it comes around. Yeah, and George, uh, contacting the procurement office, I mean, that office exists at a private university that's not a state-run university. Yeah. Uh, the state-run universities just have more regulations that they have to run through. So if this is a small institution that maybe has 10, 15, 20 pianos instead of 50 or 100, and it's a private institution, still just get in touch with their office. And uh, the procurement office is usually going to be on the other side of campus, somewhere next to the business administration office and the enrollment office. All those offices tend to be together. They're not in the music building. Nobody that you need to talk to is currently in the music building. So just go network your way around the university, get into that office and then you know you'll be able to get into the folks in the music building um, but either way the procurement office is usually the way to go now in all of these groups you want the people in your tribe to become recurring customers who gain value every time you show up who take your advice and who ask you to service their piano often so remember Failure can look like an ideal customer inside your tribe, never booking another appointment or only booking once every five years. It's not enough to get into their home. You have to be invited back. So after every appointment, ask if they would like to pre-book the next service call. Prom and then this is important. Promise immediately before they say anything, promise to remind them as the date approaches and assure them they can cancel or reschedule if they need. Then put them on your calendar months in advance and let Gazelle do its job so the customer doesn't reschedule this appointment or is automatically reminded and then a month out they go, oh yeah, I need to reschedule that for the next week. And then you're not stuck with the last minute opening, right? This is the cheapest form of advertising that you can do because you are now working with somebody who used to be in an outer circle, but is now in your innermost circle. And you are filling your calendar months in advance with loyal customers who pre-book, keep their appointments, and service their piano regularly. Which leads us to the next logical step. You need to understand the various advertising platforms out there and use the right marketing tools at every step of the way. So note that if we woke up in your shoes, this is the order we would do this in because the things we're about to list are sorted from most valuable and least expensive to least valuable and most expensive. So your website is an advertising platform. It's an asynchronous way for you to communicate with your customers. It sells the value of your business and provides options like booking their appointment online. This is also the foundation of all your digital advertising. So start here. You don't want to pay to send someone to a bad website. And we did an entire webinar on this called Building a Simple, a Powerful and Simple Website. But just imagine the tragedy of having an ineffective website and thinking that all you need to do to grow your business is to run a bunch of paid ads that sends people to a website that doesn't convert them into paying customers. Now, this is a great way to set $1,000 on the table and then light it on fire. Instead, spend an hour watching our webinar quickly and easily spend a day improving simple things on your website that make all the difference in the world. Also, create a hidden page on your website for existing customers to surprise a friend with a gift, where customers can send a special new customer discount to any friend. They can't qualify themselves for the discount because they're not a new customer. But you can also reward them on the back end of this with something big, like a $50 thank you every time one of their friends books and completes their first appointment. And I'll actually never forget, I, I said this to somebody because I did this in my own business like five years ago at a, a convention. I met this guy. He was like, hey, how did you grow your business? And I was just like, I'll just try this. He gets in touch with me five years later. And he's like, Tim, I just got to tell you, I did that. That was the only thing I ever did to build my business. And holy cow, it just, it worked. 
And, you know, that was all he did. So, you know, you don't have to do all of these things. Sometimes something simple like this is enough, right? And this is being a little more proactive than just handing out a business card, right? In this case, you are actually helping facilitate your customer's position as a guide in their friend's life. And as a guide who loves their friend, they are sharing this helpful information with them that will ultimately save their friend money. And you are simply removing all the friction. So it's easy for them to do business with you, easy to share this info with their friend, and easy to fill in the blank. Now, if you have a good website already put together, you can spend a few hours doing some basic search engine optimization. So just make sure your page titles, your headers, company address, privacy policy, and all the links and web forms on your site work. Broken links and high bounce rates will diminish your search rankings. And George, go ahead and um, if and I said, George, uh, everybody watching, if you're doing this and you're not really sure what is involved in that list, go ahead and search for SEO optimization in whatever website builder you're yeah. using. There is probably a checklist in an article that also includes screenshots with go here, do this, go here, do this, go here, do this. Here's the 10 most common things. Um, this is just a basic list, but these are the really easy things to do. That it doesn't take that much time. And literally, you could probably do this in just a couple hours. So next, get lots of online reviews and lots of social proof and lots of public places. This is the next thing on the to-do list. So build a website, do some basic SEO, and immediately turn your focus to building online reviews. You should already have some. And we have an entire webinar dedicated to helping you get more if you are not getting online reviews right now, right? So if you're not doing this right now, you need to be doing this. If you want to be relevant when people search on Google. And only after you have a good website with basic SEO and you've started collecting online reviews, that's when you begin to run any kind of paid ads. Otherwise, you're just chasing good money after bad, okay? So here are some tips for paid ads. Paid ads are something you're going to turn off and turn on and off as needed, right? The time to run ads is not right before summer vacation. It's right before the school year starts, before holidays, and right before cold snaps or season changes. Online ads are not something where you can just set it and forget it. They require active management, and you should monitor them so you can kill the ad if it's not performing. Now, run ads on a limited scale. Stay within your cactive only spend money you've saved, not money you hope to earn from the ads, right? Don't spend money you don't have. Lots of people clicking on paid ads who then immediately bounce from your website are going to drive you broke in a heartbeat. So limit your ads to your cat ratio and make sure you get good conversions. Some more tips to do here are things like use negative keywords to omit groups of people who don't fit your target market. For instance, I ran an online ad once that didn't do well, and I eventually realized that the ad was showing up every time somebody searched for piano sheet music, right? My ad was too broad. I had picked a category. I, it was even confusing how in the world this happened. But once I realized it was happening, I just created a negative keyword for that ad called sheet music. And that stopped my ad from showing if the search contained these words. Not to mention, Google will downgrade the quality score of your ad and stop showing it altogether if you create an ad that doesn't meet certain criteria. For instance, if you create a piano tuning ad and send them to the About Us page on your website that has nothing to do with piano tuning, it's just about who you are, Google will punish you for this kind of behavior and downgrade your quality score. And we've mentioned this a few times, but create a unique landing page. It's a hidden page on your website that they can only get to from this ad, all right? And so for each ad you run, you're gonna have a separate landing page and this will improve your click-through rates, improve your quality score and track conversions. For instance, if you have a paid ad running for five tips to help young kids have fun practicing piano, then create a hidden landing page on your website entirely dedicated to this topic with unique calls to action and page titles. This will help you get better quality scores, which means your ad will get shown more and it will cost less. 
So your quality score is something defined by each advertising platform. For instance, Google and Facebook both have their own versions of this and they have different metrics that they use to determine if your paid ad is worth showing to their customers, right? If you don't play by their rules, then your ad will not be shown as often and or they will charge you more for showing the ad when it does show up. So we don't have time to cover all the unique things for every platform out there, nor are we experts on this. But suffice to say, there is usually a lot of information online for learning how to manage ads inside a specific platform and how to run better ads. So if this is where you're at in your business and this is something that you're considering doing, also think through the fact that we strongly recommend you use your marketing budget to actually outsource some of this to a professional unless you're really eager to add digital advertising expert to your resume. Now, the next thing we'd recommend doing is more in-depth SEO on your website. It's time to circle back and either hire an expert or spend some more time learning how to do this yourself. So being able to get even better organic search results will result in even less need for paid ads. So paying for ads or paying for SEO both cost money, but long-term, paid ads cost more and are something you turn on and off as needed, like a faucet. SEO is something you need to run properly in the background all the time. Otherwise, nobody is ever going to go to your website unless you pay them a lot of money to be there. And that's an expensive mistake to make in your business. Next, start scheduling lunch meetings and networking so you can start sending business to other businesses in your area. Right? You can build a local service directory that you pass out as a guide. You can list people on your website and you can have a copy uh, that uh, a copy of all these people on an, uh, sorry, and you can copy these people on an email every time you refer a potential customer their way. So this is a piano teacher. Every time you meet a customer who has a daughter that's gonna start piano lessons and you think, okay, here's your needs. You know what, I, this piano teacher over here and this piano teacher over here are probably the two that I know who would really be a, a good fit for what I see in your daughter. So I, I'll, I'll refer you to them. I'm gonna send two separate emails, one to each one. And I'm just going to say, hey, Sally, just want to let you know, I just met this customer. I've copied them on this email. Um, their daughter's name is Stephanie. And, you know, we were talking about piano lessons. And I felt like you might be one of the piano teachers in the area that could really serve her and meet her needs. Right. You didn't promise that that was the exclusive one that you sent it to. And then I'm going to go send that same email to somebody else who, you know, actually would meet their needs as well. So maybe I have two people who teach young kids in my database. And so I'm, I'm going to go copy an email on to the other piano teacher as well. Same thing. If this is a piano uh, gallery, right, you're going to copy the salesperson or the owner of the store on it. Like, hey, so-and-so, I just trashed their piano. It was unsalvageable. It couldn't be repaired. And they're going to be in the market for a new piano. I just wanted to connect the two of you so that you could tell them what kind of new or used inventory was on your floor as a way to help my customer. Right, and I'm just gonna connect the two of them, but I'm always gonna copy them on the email because as soon as you start doing this and you're referring potential customers their way, that is when you will start watering the seeds of collaboration between your businesses. Now, only after doing everything on this list would we recommend beginning to run print ads in music venue programs. Remember, we're, we're sorting this list from most affordable and most effective the least affordable and least effective. So this is usually a higher cost way of targeting a specific tribe of people in your local area. But then after a few months of running ads, it'll open the door for you to meet the program or venue director like we mentioned earlier. Now take a rest. Before you run full speed into a brick wall, take a deep breath and maybe even a vacation. If you're a freelancer or a solo technician and you do everything we've covered so far, your business is probably approaching a tipping point and you probably can't sustain much more without going through a stage change, uh, which will help you manage the growth of a bigger book of business. This is probably also a good time to watch our webinar on tripling your revenue, where we walk you through the kinds of things you'll need to have in place to guide your business through these stage change challenges. Now, there are two more overarching themes and topics that we would be remiss if we didn't discuss. 
The first is piggybacking your growth on an existing business. Now, the reason we save this for last is because I want you to imagine a small child running up to you and asking for a piggyback ride, right? They're cute, they don't weigh that much, and they don't have a lot of needs. Now, imagine that same child is now an adult and is still trying to score piggyback rides. Riding a wave of growth by piggybacking or informally partnering with another local business, this could be a piano gallery, a piano mover, this could even be a piano teacher, it's like asking for a piggyback ride. At times, it's a good strategy that works for a while, but if you get too big, they are going to ask you to get off. Now, this is why waltzing into a piano dealership that doesn't have a service arm and doing reduced warranty work in exchange for keeping the customers is never a long-term solution. Now, I don't want you to hear what I didn't say. I didn't say it's not a solution that can't solve some of your needs right now. There are times when that's actually a perfectly viable way to do this. And if they don't have a service arm, Gazelle can actually allow you to be a subcontractor with them where they can just plug holes in your schedule. You just connect your Gazelle calendars together. Uh, or if they have a Google calendar they're running, right, they can actually plug holes in your schedule that way. And you can just tell them, hey, all you have to do is go to this Google calendar, find a hole in my schedule. And all they see is just busy, 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 busy. Um, and then if they're using Gazelle, uh, they can just plug an address in and their side of Gazelle will tell them when you are in that area. And it keeps the clients separate and allows everybody to manage everything. This is now possible to connect these accounts in this way. So there are times when working with a piano dealership, either as a young technician doing you know, cheap warranty work on the floor uh, to get some chops and to get some experience or as a subcontractor is a viable thing. And that might actually turn into you becoming the person who starts the service arm for that entire dealership. And if they have multiple locations, you could even grow into it that way, right? So there are lots of ways to work with dealerships, um, either informally or semi-formally or formally. But either way, if you are simply thinking that doing reduced warranty work in exchange for keeping the customer is going to be a long-term solution for your business, it's not. I'm sorry to tell you. Either they're never going to get, you're never going to get enough customers, right? Eventually you get to a point where you're just like, I'm not getting enough from you, what's going on? And it's not worth your while anymore. Or they will eventually stop sending work your way. So these informal relationships rarely last long uh, before somebody's needs change. So the second thing we need to discuss is purple cows. Yeah, I said purple cows like this or this. And this friendly looking creature, now, I want you to imagine what you would do if you were driving down the road and you saw a purple cow like this grazing on the side of the road. I mean, a real live cow that was purple. You'd probably stop your car, you'd take a selfie, try to figure out if someone had painted it, whether this was some kind of joke or genetic fluke, some new bioengineering that caused the cow to be purple. Then you'd go home and you'd exclaim, you'd say, you'll not believe what I saw today. I saw a purple cow and the person you're talking to is going to not believe you. And they're going to ask for proof, in which case you're going to hop back in the car. You're going to drive back to the spot. You're going to say, see, see, I told you it's a real purple cow. At which point your, your friend's going to do the same thing you did and going to tell their friends. So what do purple cows have to do with uh, running a piano service company, right? Well, it actually has a lot to do. So Seth Godin in his book called Purple Cow has a number of takeaways uh, to apply to your business. Uh, the big ones are this, number one, purple cows are something so unique and original. They are remarkable. Essentially something worth talking about, something new and totally unique, right? Number two, very few purple cows are created. Usually they are inspired or organic solutions that serve a solve a specific problem or fill an unmet need inside a very specific community of people or a, a tribe. And, and doing good work is not a purple cow, unless literally everyone else in your area is so bad at their job or they genuinely don't care when I owed about their customers. If this is how everyone else operates and you're the only person to ever offer do good work, then yes, doing good work is a purple cow. 
but that's never the case. Doing good work is expected. It's not remarkable. So lastly, if you have a purple cow in your business, it's going to last about two years before other people start copying you. Let me give you an example of a true purple cow in our industry. Play me, I'm yours. In 2008, a British artist named Luke Gerarm had an idea. Let's get a bunch of old pianos, paint them, and put the words, play me, I'm yours, all over the case. And then scatter them around the major cities and invite the public to express their musical curiosity and art. This project is still going on nine years later and is now streetpianos.com. Documentaries have been produced and a book on the project is being written. Play Me, I'm Yours was a purple cow, but it's not anymore. The idea of street pianos is now ubiquitous. It only took 18 to 24 months after it first launched that we started seeing street pianos and the idea of street pianos popping up all over the world as copycat programs on lower scales started dotting the landscape. All that to say this, it is possible to create a purple cow or a purple isk cow for your business. All it takes is a little creativity, a great problem to solve, and a community of individuals who come together to make it happen. So purple cows spread through tribes like wildfire. This is that true wildfire word of mouth that people talk about. And if you are interested in this idea, we just highly recommend you reading Seth Godin's book on the topic, right? There have only been a few true purple cows in our industry, but not many. But as a business owner, you will almost never see the opportunity if you are not looking for it. You would never stop all other marketing to go hunting for one because you might spend your entire career thinking that you need a purple cow and you don't. But if you find one, it can be a gold mine for your business that serves the specific needs of your tribe and spreads like wildfire among the people you serve. Which brings us to step three, set new goals. So in the book, uh, The 12-Week Year, Brian Moran proposes that anything you cannot achieve in the next 12 weeks is a hope or a dream. And let me tell you, this is a powerful way to think about what you choose to focus your time on. Now, you should always be full of hope and always dreaming. We're not saying you need to give these things up as an entrepreneur, but goals are the three or four things you're doing right now that are achievable and that will be completed in the next 12 weeks. So stop wasting money on failed ads today, right? This is a great 12-week goal because it's really easy. It takes five minutes of a decision that says, if I do not have clarity on how to tell the story of my business, stop all advertising today and fix that problem. And if you watched our webinar on selling your story and building a powerful and simple website, but your website isn't built to convert new customers, stop all advertising today. Watch our webinars, do a bunch of simple things to fix your website, add two or three landing pages, and then turn paid back ads back on. Only this time, watch them be more effective. Prioritize your projects and decide which advertising projects you want to tackle. Then break the bigger projects down into smaller goals that can be achieved in the next 12 weeks. And to keep from getting overwhelmed, stop giving thought and attention to things you're not presently working on as a 12-week goal. So instead, keep a, no a notebook of ideas and do your projects in the right order, from most impactful and least expensive to least impactful and most expensive. And start thinking about the idea of a purple cow. Uh, when I first read that book, it was about a year of me just like mulling on this and thinking about it while I was tuning in pianos and working on them and driving, right? This is going to take some creativity. And piano technicians have a ton of time to be creative while you drive, while you do repetitive tasks like regulation, pitch raising, and non-concert tunings, right? But remember, don't stop all your other marketing to hunt for it. This is a both and situation and you've got to get your ground game going. 
You also need to actually calculate your churn so you know your numbers. The quick and easy way to do this, divide your total number of inactive customers by the number of years you've been in business. And this will give you the average number of customers you lose each year. Now compare this to the number of new customers you get each year. And this is gonna give you a good picture of the health of your business. And calculate your average customer acquisition cost to total lifetime value ratio, that CACTL ratio that we were talking about. So you know the upper limit of what your company should be spending right now to get a new paying customer. And retain good customers. This is part of your ground game. If you want maximum retention and increased lifetime value of customers, then you need to be pre-booking seasonal service using Gazelle's estimates to sell higher margin repairs and regulation jobs. And one tip here, if you are understaffed or you are super busy uh, and you're a solo freelancer who, you know, you, you can start sorting your deck of customers into A-list, B-list, and C-list folks, where you pre-book and heavily pursue your best customers, then do things like allow your C-list people to just organically fill holes in your schedule. But you're not going to go out of your way to get them on your calendar. And you're going to start replacing customers. And this could be uh, they're a nice person, but they're in the wrong tribe. Or they're a nice person with a war-torn spinet who's never going to upgrade. Or just a straight-up nasty individual who happens to own any kind of piano. <laughs> this could also be some of the thought of doing a big rebranding. For instance, it could be that as a young technician, you used your inner circle of influence and you discounted services using things like Thumbtack or Groupon or other platforms to build your tribe of customers. But now you're going after a different tribe and you still have a lot of these people hanging around. This could also be that you changed your business model. Maybe you started training others and building a team. You're no longer available for basic services, but you have a segment of customers who don't like change. They, they want you, and they refuse to trust the people that you've trained. Whatever it is, all of our customers have people like this in their database, and they need to cut them loose. It's just a part of the reality of working with the public. And now that you're going to replace customers, Never run a generic paid ad again, right? Test paid ads on a small scale using landing pages and minimal A-B testing if you want to be a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, but sending people from a paid ad to your homepage is like setting a pile of money in the middle of your dining room table and then lighting it on fire. Remember, failure in marketing your services looks like trying a thousand different things that never work and never understanding why, or constantly being in a state of uncertainty, losing hope, becoming exhausted because you don't know what to do about it. So instead, invest your next marketing dollar in something that will work. Know your capital ratio and your churn so you don't have to throw good money after bad. And Confidently surround yourself with your tribe, the tribe of people who have decided to serve by offering your services in your community. When you work for really awesome people who are committed to doing what you recommend, it's a really fun way to run a business. And you get to go from someone who has no idea why your business isn't attracting customers to someone who knows exactly how to fill your future calendar with tons of bookings and great customers who love you and love their piano. So while we transition uh, to the Q&A and our team sorts through the questions, here's a quick poll and a list of upcoming webinars that are coming soon. So here at Gazelle, we focus on technicians that are frustrated by inefficient scheduling of appointments, struggling with keeping up with sending out estimates and invoices on time, and lacking enough monthly revenue to consistently be profitable. If any of these resonate for you, let us know through the poll how we can serve you next. You can also visit growwithgazelle.com forward slash school to listen to previous webinars and sign up for next month's webinar. And we'll be covering every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. The team at Gazelle is excited to help you find the tools you need to save your time, wow your customers, so that you can focus on growing your business 
and doing what you enjoy most. Yeah, and George, uh, next month's webinar is on hiring your first technician. And that registration is open now. Thanks, Tim. All right, thank you guys. That was a great presentation. Uh, we've had uh, some questions come in. Um, so I think we'll transition over here to the Q&A for a little bit. Um, let me just jump right in with the first question. Um, he says, um, can you explain the purpose of the hidden landing page again? Um, why shouldn't these pages be seen normally? Sure, so a hidden landing page, what it does is it allows, again, you're not sending any links from your website to that landing page. This is somewhere where an ad from somewhere else is landing on that page and then linking them to your website. That hidden landing page is actually a great way for you to then measure how well your advertisements are working. So it's gonna show you your click-through rates um, as well as give a place that you can specially focus your messaging towards that advertisement. Tim, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I think the easiest way to think about this is if you create a page on your website whose only purpose is to process people from a specific paid ad, then you can look at the metrics on that page and know exactly how well that ad is working. I'll give you an example. One of the quality score things in Google is how quickly people bounce, right? So if they click on an ad and then bounce and leave within nanoseconds, Google is going to degrade your quality score, stop showing your ad. And when it does show your ad, they're going to raise the rates that you have to pay to show that ad because you have a poor quality score. Well, that's not very fun. Uh, however, you figure this out by going to that hidden landing page in your website builder and looking at some metrics and going, oh, why do I have a 92% bounce rate on this one ad I'm running? Okay, and then you go there and you realize that, oh, whoops, um, I accidentally put the wrong text up there. And this was an ad about piano tuning and I started immediately talking about piano repairs or something like that. So the landing page is super specific and customized to the ad. And the purpose of that is to process people who are interested in the topic of the ad. Uh, and you also don't wanna muddy the waters. So if you make this page publicly available, it's hidden, it's hidden to search engines so people can't find it on Google and it's not linked anywhere on your public marketing pages, right? So on, the only way to get to it is from that Google ad. If you allow it to be cl uh, clickable or searchable from a search engine or you link to it from somewhere else on your website, then you're just like sending a bunch of people to this and you go look at the bounce rates and you're like, I have no clue why people are bouncing. I don't know if it's because the ad was bad. I don't know if because somebody's Googling this over here and I'm showing up oddly in Google. You have no idea. And so if you have five paid ads running, you want to have five landing pages for each specific paid ad. It just gives you more control, more visibility, and tells you if that page is working. All right, thank you. Um, I've got another question here. Um, I've already tried many of these, um, but they've not been very successful for me. What should I do? That is a great question. Yeah. Um, I would say start with, I would say start with emailing George and scheduling a time to talk with him because here's what I'm guessing. And I, I don't know who this is or what the situation is, but when I hear I'm doing all the right things and it's just not working, you're, you're missing a fundamental building block somewhere. That's one possibility. And that's something George is really good at helping people figure out. And it could be that the way you're presenting this or the way you're telling your story just needs to be tweaked a little bit, right? Um, it could also be just a size problem if you are a young technician um, I remember it took about 300 to 500 active customers before word of mouth was any kind of blip on my radar. So I was like, oh, I'm doing all this. I'm doing good work. I'm talking to customers, trying to get people to pre-book. I'm doing all this. I'm just not getting people to refer me. What's going on? Well, turns out I was doing like 70% of the stuff just fine. I just needed time. So if this is a time problem, the most frustrating thing to do is to spin your wheels thinking it's you. 
thinking you're doing something wrong. It could be you're doing everything right. And this is a time issue. And it can be really helpful to have somebody else just look at it from the outside and say, yeah, actually, this is a time issue. Be patient. Uh, let's help you like get some 12 week goals going. And it could just be that you're investing in way too many things at, at one time, right? You're trying to do 50 different things and you need to be focusing on two things in the next six weeks and two things in the next six weeks. And then you're going to take a week of rest and you're going to pick four more things to focus on. You'll actually get more done that way than trying to focus on 28 things at once. Um, George, I'll punt that back to you since that's more your wheelhouse. No, I, I think I think you really nailed it. And right off the bat, Tim, when I hear that question, I heard the same thing you heard, right? Is is I would want to first take a step back. <laughs> I would want to sit down. And I'd like you to tell me what the story of your business is. And then I'd well, love to do a website review for you. Um, and then I'd like to hear more about who your tribe is, who you think your tribe is. When you're able to tell me about what the philosophical problem is that you're trying to solve, and the audience that you're trying to reach, then I would be able to really get into that. Why is my efforts not working? Um, and then honestly, I, that's when we would brainstorm and just throw things against the wall and see what it is. If that's if you have a well-formed tribe that you're reaching for, uh, what are the things you have tried specifically? When I hear I've tried everything, I also hear and understood for everyone. And I, that's really getting it down to this idea of sometimes trying less actually gets you more, which is, I think, what you were getting at, Tim, as well. Yeah. And I'm going to actually drop my email into the uh, chat for anybody who would like to take advantage of that. Already on it, George. Oh, there look at go. that. I was doing it for you. <laughs> All right. All right. We've got another question just came in. Um, I plan to re relocate my business across the country over the summer. I have a decent sized business now. How can I best take what I already know and apply that to a growing business from scratch again? Yeah. Um, there are like 12 different ways to go with that. Um, the best thing you can do there was a slide in there where George just said, rest and take and a big exhale. Mm -hmm. um, if you've already built a decent sized business, uh, it is gonna be far easier and far faster to do what you've already done again in a new city, okay? And so I know it's, it's scary thinking about that. And, you know, it's like, oh man, it took me five years to get to this point. And now I'm going to uproot and move. No, it's probably going to take you 18 months, 24 months, because you already have this mountain of failure underneath you and you're not going to be wasting your time. So I would say just take a moment to rest, take a moment to exhale. Um, the other thing is, I don't know what the deadlines are on this move. I don't know anything about like where, um, what, uh, this is cross country. I, I would do as much as I could, uh, is to be visiting there, building relationships and doing all that. It's really hard to do that remotely, especially all the way across country, but you, do what you can hit the ground running, go ahead and have your entire website ready to rock and roll on day one in the new city. Go ahead and have your Google reviews there and also look into transferring That's your Google, um, your Google listing, your Google My Business listing to the new city. Okay, there's some steps that Google will take to allow you to do that, and it will, in most cases, it will carry all your reviews with you. Um, and so, uh, those are that's just shooting from the hip. Um, and then, George, what would you add to that? Uh, first, honestly, I was going to start with that social proof. So that mm -hmm. idea of getting your reviews and taking them with you. Um, Collect up what you can and make sure that that'll be on your website. Uh, with, yep. if, uh, so that's number one. Number two, reality is with the world, with the way the world is right now, yes, it is hard to be able to sit down with somebody over a cup of coffee. Yeah. So it's not unexpected for somebody to contact somebody and say, hey, you know, I'd love to have a conversation with you over the phone or via Zoom. So you actually are in a really interesting situation where you can actually start building relationships with those piano teachers, with those music venues. Um, whichever area you decide you're going to start working on now from farther away, uh, because everything's from farther away right now. It doesn't matter that you're physically in that location and taking them to a cafe in town. Um, so I would say, like Tim said, start building 
Don't think of it as that your business is moving when you physically move. Start moving your business mentally and start setting up relationships in that community before you ever land. That's, that's what yeah. I would add. Yeah, and honestly, um, all of the uh, stuff surrounding COVID, the pandemic and people's willingness to do stuff remotely, wow, what a gift at this point in time that you're going to yeah. be able to do this. Because uh, honestly, 12, 12 months ago, a year ago, yeah. the idea that somebody would contact you and ask for a video chat, um, and now it's just like commonplace, like, oh yeah, you're moving to the area, sure, let's video chat. Um, and so I would be networking on that front uh, with everybody. Um, and if you have already set up like the uh, local resource guide, I would email that to the piano teacher and say, hey, here's what I did in the city that I'm currently in. Here's what I'm looking to do in this city. Uh, would love to meet with you over Zoom. Could we make that happen? I'm going to be here on this date, but I'm just you know looking to meet people ahead of time. So I have one more thing to add um, is I would go back to the Seth Godin's concept of raving customers, right? Is if you've got um, that decent sized business, then I would hope that you have some raving customers in that group. And reality is that because of the world we live in, the global connections that people have, um, there are people in your tribe already that are connected to the area that you are moving to. Um, so at some point when you need to, you'll be able to reach out to your current customers and ask them to help you. You're, I'm not saying all of them, but you choose your top 10 best, your, your top 50, your top 100, and ask them to help you set down roots in your new location. Um, and again, this is starting to reach into that idea of knowing the people Again, starting in the inner circle, asking the people who know the people who know you um, so that you can start setting down new seeds. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can start growing a business in another location like that. I've got another question that just came in. Um, uh, yeah, oh, Luke, real, real, real quick. I have one more thing to add to that topic. Um, established technicians are retiring at a faster pace post COVID. Yeah, there is. I would contact every single person in the area and say, uh, just just wanted to touch base. If you are interested in selling your business or your clientele, I'm going to be coming to the area. Um, you know, I would love to sit down and talk with you. Um, and so that would be a way to jumpstart it. And that's pretty unique to this point in time. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens as we kind of round the corner on the backside of this pandemic stuff and if people who said they were going to do this, you know, follow through this year or next year, but I can tell you, I am seeing so many people um, making the decision that, you know what, now's the time for me to retire. Uh, and they have client bases that are, they're looking to offload to uh, a really established technician or somebody that knows what they're doing. So, um, all right, back to you, Luke. Thank you. How do I find piano teachers in my area? Almost none of them advertise here. I think this actually ties could tie into the previous question too. How do you in in for that person who was looking for and moving to a new area? How do you find piano technicians to advertise to? All right. Um, Sorry, piano teachers, not piano technicians. <laughs> so if if you're trying to track down piano teachers, and most of them are going to be like you're saying, they don't advertise. A lot of them are looking at that word of mouth. So you need to find a place where you can listen to where that word of mouth is being shared. So that means doing things like talking to the music teachers um, in the schools. Uh, that might mean going to your local piano um, sales area. That might mean, <laughs> as silly as this sounds, go to your local Panera Bread and go to the community board in the back. Almost every Panera has a big cork board where somebody has placed their business card ticked up or maybe just a flyer. Um, and a lot of those do have that kind of uh, looking for a local piano, uh, piano teacher. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't go out of my way to drive to every Panera today, no. but I would put it on my list that on my way home, I have 15 <laughs> Panera breads in this 30 mm -hmm. mile area. And as I'm driving home every day, I'm going to make a point of stopping and checking. Um, if I get gas, I'm going to go get gas next to the Panera and then walk in and check, just you know, yeah. do something like that. But um, I would start by talking to every single one of your people, of your current customers after, and do this in person after the appointment. Um, and so I oftentimes on the front end of the appointment would ask, okay, so how do you use the piano? If they mentioned a piano teacher, 
the same thing that we recommended earlier with the music directors. Oh, you go to church. Well, do you know that most music directors have this problem? I'm, I, I can solve that. That's my specialty. I would come up with a similar phrase uh, for piano teachers. So if you're talking to somebody and they say, oh yeah, I take lessons or you know, my daughter take lessons. I would say, oh, that's really cool. Um, hey, did you know that most piano teachers really struggle with, uh, I mean, they're, they're teachers, all teachers struggle with, you know, not being compensated enough for what they're worth. And I really resonate with that because I was a teacher at one point in my life. And so I actually have a special discount I give piano teachers. Um, oh, and, and, you know, I've got this thing that you can give your piano teacher. All you have to do is forward it on. And I'm going to have, again, a hidden page on my website that people can't get to unless I tell them how to get to it called send your piano teacher a gift. Right. And then they're going to send their piano teacher a 20 or $30 gift of some kind. That's a discount on a service um, and things like that. Um, and then I would really spend a lot of time. Uh, go back to the selling your story process that we talked about and uh, that story brand process and say, okay, what is that philosophical problem that I can solve with piano teachers? Like what is true about most piano teachers? Most piano teachers have this problem. Now, how do I solve that problem? Most piano teachers are really frustrated uh, when the student's piano isn't functioning well because it means that their students can't progress. And most of them don't know that that's the problem. I solve that problem by educating teachers and helping their students find an affordable solution for their piano to play better. Would you like to connect me with your piano teacher and you can give them this gift and then I'll, I'll go in and do that, right? And so I would go through that process and I just came up with that on the fly, um, but I spent a lot of time walking into people's homes and you know, I'll, uh, this, uh, I, would, I would refuse to say anything until I could pinpoint that philosophical problem. And I would just keep asking questions. So if I was going to go down that piano teacher trail, um, I had to practice this. And so I would, oh, you have a piano teacher. Great. Tell me about them. And then they tell me about them. And I think, oh, shoot, I haven't figured out something to say. So I'd ask another question. Okay, great. Do they live in the area? Okay. Oh, and I would just keep asking questions while I'm sitting there thinking like, all right, what's that philosophical problem I could do? And then they would hit something and I would put the words together and I'd say, okay, great. Well, just so you know, um, you know, most piano teachers, and then that's how I came up with this kind of stuff. And oh my, it, I, I'll just tell you, it works. Um, you know, people will actually, oh, that's great. They'll email the piano teacher or send you their information before you're done with the appointment while you're working. And then by the end of the appointment, you can just have some copy and paste things that you email to the piano teacher. Um, and it's really that simple. Um, so just go to your people and, but it's an, if you're not intentional about it, it's never going to happen. It is not the kind of thing that you want to passively like, oh, here's my business card, pass it on to the piano teacher. I mean, that'll work 5% of the time, 10% of the time, but it's not going to like throw a light under some gasoline for you. Um, it'll have to compound over time and it's going to be slow and painful. And uh, so I like to figure out how to accelerate some of those things when I'm dealing with it. So um, the other thing, call, call around to every single church, okay? Call them on Tuesday because most of the small churches' offices are closed on Monday. Ask me why I know, all right? Uh, and so you're going to call on Tuesday and you're going to say, hey, um, I'm just a member of the community. And I was wondering, do you have any members of your congregation that teach piano lessons? Now, there's 1,200 churches probably within your radius or more. I mean, I'm in a big metro area. There are tens of thousands of uh, communities and churches and things that I can hit. And you could, the, the church secretary will absolutely get that information out to you. Absolutely, right? They're not going to be like, oh no, if, if they say no, then they don't know. But there's a church pianist there. That pianist knows somebody. They're gonna give you the church pianist's information. They're gonna be like, oh yeah, I'd love to help you. Um, I actually don't know, but here's Sally. She's our church pianist. Here's her number. Uh, here's her email address. Can I just like email her for you? And I say, yeah, would you mind just copying me on the email and introducing us? Okay, yeah, that'd be great. And then I get a copied email from, you know, the, the church secretary to the church piano saying, hey, so-and-so is looking for piano teachers in the area. And then I'm just like networking in that way and going, okay, well, you know, what, um, you know, who do you know? And then I email the teacher and yeah, oh, thank you so much, Sally. And, you know, here's, here's why. 
I'm a piano technician who has customers and I've got a customer looking for a piano teacher who lives five minutes from your church or something like that. It's better if it's a real situation or I just generically say, I have customers all the time in your area and I'm just, I don't have anybody strong to recommend and I'm trying to meet people, you know, thanks for introducing me, right? That's, that's how I would do it. And you'll build a list of piano teachers organically that aren't on Google pretty darn fast that way. All right, next question. Uh, I really like the concept of grading customers. You mentioned A, B, and C lists. Would you recommend creating these as reminders in, as reminders in Gazelle? Um, I'm a 34 year, I'm 34 years in and really want to replace a lot of my old customers. <laughs> yes, um, you would create three different reminders. Now here's what you want to do um, to anybody that wants to run their reminders this way. You want to have a default reminder and typically the default reminder is the A list, right? We're going to assume the best. We're going to assume that when a customer comes in, they're an A list customer. Your A list reminder, I would even call it A list reminder. It's your default reminder. It's going to have a certain reminder schedule. It's going to, you know, remind email, text. We're going to try to keep this customer. We're going to do everything we can. Your C, your B list customers are going to be have fewer reminders, fewer points of contact spread over a longer period of time. Your C list customers may or may not have any contact scheduled, right? Then all your customers are probably on one reminder right now. We have a reminder reassignment tool. Once you've got those reminders built out, then you can just say, okay, go grab all of my grand pianos and any piano I serviced in the last year and put them on my A list. We're gonna start there. Go grab everybody who hasn't serviced their piano in this date range and we're gonna put them on B list. And anybody with a spinet or an upright piano or a console or something like that, you know, is going to go over here in this list. Um, and, you know, you would just segment them that way. And um, the customers, uh, you know, are none the wiser that this is how you're sorting people. Um, and then also know that as soon as you put them on the new reminder, their reminders will start over again. So you don't want a situation where they were on the old reminder and they got an email yesterday, then you switch reminders and they get an email today, right? So to avoid that, plan your A list, B list, C list, get it all prepped and ready to go. Now turn all your piano do for service reminders off on your existing reminder. Wait for a couple of weeks. The only reminders that go out are your appointment-based reminders. Then you can even pause those for a week if you want, if everybody's confirmed for that week. Then you pivot everybody. And then, you know, people haven't gotten a reminder in a couple of weeks and nobody's uh, none the wiser. So um, that's, we've helped a lot of people do that. It's a good way of handling it. Yeah, Tim, I'm going to add one thing to everything you just said, actually, which is um, I'm going to introduce you to the D-list, right? <laughs> So the D list is that you walk, you finish the sale, everything's done, you walk out to your car and you deactivate the client. Yes. Right. And, and the idea here is that you just say, I'm not going to spend any time sending them reminders. I'm going to say, if they decide to call me again, then I'll book. Um, but I'm not going to chase them. Um, and and you, you can't do this necessarily when you're just starting out. Um, but when you are ready to start swapping out clients or you're ready to just fire a client and say, I'm not, I'm not going to do work at that house again, this is a way to handle that. Yeah, Your and George, it reminds me, I did something similar. I, didn't, I wasn't at a stage in my life where I had A list, B list, C list, but I was very intentional with who was in my tribe. And I gave a lot of thought to it. And I, I said, okay, so the people in my tribe are people where when I walk into the house, the piano is the most important thing in that house. That's my tribe. When I walk into that situation, my, I, my A game is on. I'm going to try to keep this client. I'm going to do everything. And I started noticing something. Um, these customers all had manicured lawns. They had lights on the walkway as I walked up. It was daylight, right? The lights were never on. I never noticed it before. But, it was day, but they all had like light in the landscaping. And so I, and then I would walk into the house and the piano wasn't in the back room. It was in the center room. Um, they were typically very well decorated houses and occasionally it would be a not so decorated house, but it, and it wouldn't have the best lawn and it wouldn't have lights, but I'll tell you what, it was the nicest yard on the street. And that's saying a lot for some of these yards because the street wasn't that nice. And I was in a part of town where I just knew like, Hey, I don't really have a lot of customers here. Um, but I would walk up to a house. It'd be the nicest yard on the street. I'd walk in. It, it would be a small house with a big grand piano. 
Now I know, man, this piano is smack in the middle of the family room. Like it's the most important thing in this person's life. That was my customer. I also learned a couple other things that the people who weren't my customers um, and they had kind of their own thing over here. And typically it was either how they behaved, how they responded or things like that. So I actually started just inactivating people as soon as I got to the car. And I had two different spiels. First spiel was for A-list people where I really went after it and was like, okay, we pre-booked all of our people. You know, we get them on the calendar. We remind you, you don't have to worry about anything. If you need to reschedule, you can. Would you like to do that? Yes. And if I knew that I was going to be inactivating this person, I would smile. I would take the check. I would give them a card and I would say, thank you so much for your business. Here's my card. If there's ever anything I can do for you, please let me know. And then I'd walk out to the car, I'd inactivate the file, I'd put a big old note on the file as to why I inactivated it, so that if they ever booked, I would see that note and that notice, or my staff would see it. I only ever had one or two people where I was like, I will not do business with you. Um, there were only a couple of those people, but you know, there'd be a lot of times somebody, um, I had one lady that uh, she was meticulous about her piano's finish. And she insisted, she called me out because the, the cleaners scratched her piano. And I, I spent a lot of time, you know, no, ma'am, that you know, it doesn't look like that kind of damage and all that stuff. But anyway, I put a big old note on the file. And two years later, she called me out saying that I had scratched her piano bench while I was there. And I knew not to approve the appointment. I just got on the phone and I called her and I said, I'm sorry, that scratch was there. I actually have pictures to prove it. I'm so sorry that's the case. Um, pulled up the files and, you know, I let her go. Um, and I, you know, so those notes are really important, but it's why did you inactivate it? Why did you choose this? Because you're going to forget about it and not remember it. So, you know, Tim, listening to you talk, I think one of the things that I love about this field is that what you described as like that target tribe you saw with the manicured lawns, um, that everybody has a different tribe, right? Everybody has a different group that they're looking for. And so your indicators of a tribe may be completely different than Tim's. Yeah. Um, it's really about who you're wanting to serve. You might be looking for the child with the shy eyes who's watching you tune their instrument, mm -hmm. right? Um, or So it really is about what your target, what your tribe looks like, and does the client, does, does the customer you're working with fit that tribe? And do you want to continue working with them? And then A, B, C, or D. And I would never want to work for somebody who uh, accused me of scratching their, their piano. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got one final question here before we wrap it up. Um, should I, as a new technician, look to acquire all tribes in order to get general revenue before moving to specific tribes? Yes and no. Um, you should spend at least enough time to figure out what tribes you want to hit for your business. And honestly, go watch the website video we did because you want to be very clear about that on your website. You're going to have a philosophical problem. Your business is hitting. And that by definition, if you just, if you build your website the way we recommend and it's simple and powerful, by definition, you've exclusively chosen a tribe and you need to stick to that and you need to be really comfortable with that. And you need to know that you are going to attract certain people and you're not going to attract certain people. So in that sense, no, it's a waste of time for you to go, uh, 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 you know, chase all these customers over here. It would almost be better for you to go work at Starbucks and, um, you know, work a side hustle and a side job in order to get this thing spun up to pay the bills and only build with the people who you get. Because what's going to happen is you're going to spin up with those people faster. You're going to sell them $500 and $800 and $1,000 jobs. And one day you're going to wake up and be like, man, I can sell one regulation or, you know, this repair or that voicing. And I, it's like a week's worth of time at Starbucks. I'm done with Starbucks. Um, you know, so I don't know what the situation is. I would side hustle it. And if I woke up in your shoes, that's what I would do. Um, because eventually you're going to have to fire all those customers. And you think you're going to spin up revenue faster. But every dollar that you take from one of those customers is painful. 
And I can say that as somebody who took a lot of dollars from customers that were not in my tribe, it is painful to work for these people, not because they're bad people, not because they're bad pianos, but you know, you're trying to do this and they don't want that. And there's this tension as soon as you walk into the home and then you walk out of there feeling like crud. I don't need that in my life. And I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. So George, no. how, how would you go about yeah, that? So, so in a past life, I was a backpacker and I loved hiking the trails. And I got to tell you, not every hike is on the top of the mountain, right? You're always climbing. So however, not every hike should be through the brambles, right? You want to stay on the trail. So what that means is to me is that you're going to, actually go back to the idea of selling your story, right? And you should, like, like Tim said, know the character in your story and have it well-defined. Um, and that's, again, something I love to spend time with. Um, you can contact me about that. And so getting to know, watch that webinar, Selling Your Story, and get to know who the character in your story is. And then because all your marketing is pointing to that, you're going to draw more of them in. Are you going to get customers who are outside of your tribe? Yes. Should you turn them down? No, book it. Take that money. Um, because you do need to fund your business as you continue to get more of, of your tribe in. Um, but should you throw that giant net for everybody everywhere? No, because again, marketing to everybody is marketing to nobody. So you want to keep it focused, allow in people that you gather who are outside of your tribe, um, but then keep, keep growing that core. So Tim, a lot of really the same stuff that you said, I, I just think, um, really getting down, spending that time to thinking about your story and how your story plays out on your website really is the baseline for all your marketing. Yeah. I, I personally, in my life, when I have decisions like this, I think about it in terms of running a lean deck. Mm. Do you know how many poker hands you win when all you have are aces, kings, and jacks? Pretty much every hand where you don't, there's not a queen involved and you have a jack. But most of the time you have an ace, a king, or a jack in there as well because you run a lean deck. And um, that's going to go far faster and get you far further uh, than if you run a whole deck and you end up with a bunch of hands with twos. And, or I, I guess maybe four twos would be good in poker. That's a bad analogy. But anyway, you get the point. Like you don't want to water down all of your efforts. You want to focus your efforts. And there's a lot to be said for focusing your efforts on the right things and learning how to be exclusive. The other thing is that once you build that identity for your business, there's actually a lot of ways for people to fit themselves into that. And so if you're just generally spatting it out there that, hey, I generally do this stuff, nobody's going to ever identify with you. But there's a chance that if you do specifically do this, somebody's going to go, you know, I never saw that in me until I read your website, but I'm actually that person. And you actually helped them become a customer. That happens too when you do what we taught in the last two webinars. So I would actually email George, go through those webinars and really hone in and run a lean deck in your business. And then if you need to pay bills, um, get your four walls in place, food, shelter, clothing, transportation, and side hustle it um, with another career until you spin this up. And use Gazelle's estimates. Average estimate brings in $900 of new revenue, <laughs> right? And so just do estimates. If you're not doing estimates, do estimates because that's going to generate a lot of extra cash in your business right away with the right customers. Well, thank you guys. That uh, comes to the end of all of our questions here. Uh, that was a fantastic webinar. Great, uh, great answers to the questions. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. I uh, just want to remind you again that registration is open for our next webinar, which is hiring your first technician. Um, you can get to that at uh, growwithgazelle.com slash school. And uh, we will be posting uh, the slides and this webinar up there um, later this week. Um, have a good evening. Thanks for joining us. Good night.